The multi-million pound health research institute. Richard Payne has this report. American visitors tour central Bristol, but this is no ordinary tourist trail. It's the only one of the three houses that she lived in that remains. The other two have been demolished. Direct descendants of Elizabeth Blackwell learn about the woman whose work in the world of medicine was ahead of its time. Since we were children, we've been told stories about Aunt Elizabeth. You know, the family members uh, have kept the, the memories alive and are quite proud of her and her generation. But it's quite moving to see the house that she grew up in uh, when she was a little girl and to know that that was a garden and that was the garden where she played, which she, she wrote about in her, her later books. So it's, it's wonderful. A green plaque on the wall of a tucked away house hardly does Elizabeth Blackwell justice, however. After emigrating to America with her family, she became that nation's first woman to receive a medical degree. With buildings, statues, even a film in her honour, she's better known over there than she is in Bristol, where she was born in 1821. Mary Wright has spent 20 years of her life researching the woman who founded the National Health Society, the forerunner to the NHS, with its then forward-thinking motto, prevention is better than cure. She was a contemporary of Florence Nightingale and trained the first health visitors. She did, and a great achievement, open the medical profession to women. She was a pioneer, and that in itself is, is great. But uh, she did it alone, without any wealth or influence or privilege. And it was a great challenge to her to open the medical profession, but it was the way she did it, which I think is very worthy of being honoured. Now she is. The University of Bristol has established the £12 million Elizabeth Blackwell Institute for Health Research to accelerate the translation of medical research into new treatments and therapies to benefit patients. I was really taken by what Elizabeth Blackwell did, what she stood for, and I think she's a fantastic icon for the Institute. And she's a, a local unsung hero. One of the first projects is to develop sensor systems to monitor the health of people who live alone detecting abnormal changes in people's physical activity, gait and mood, especially after major operations. A short film highlighting the project through the words of the public has been produced by Ardman Animations in their inimitable style. It could be really good for certain sort of illnesses, so if someone's forgetting things, um, I can't, well, whenever people get forgetful, as it were, and uh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, medical advances to help the masses, just as Elizabeth Blackwell herself made all those years ago. Richard Payne, ITV News, Bristol. What a woman, hey? I was going to say, yeah. Brunel, Banks and Blackwell. Oh, Sounds good. Now, uh, think of World Heritage Sites and attractions like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia or the Egyptian Pyramids may come to mind, or maybe nearer to home, the city of Bath, of course. But now there is a bid to add the seafront at Clevedon to that esteemed list. A group from the town is applying to UNESCO, hoping to secure World Heritage status. Jane Solomons reports. Its admirers say there's a timelessness about Clevedon, the elegant Victorian pier, perhaps the town's best-known feature. Most of the beachfront houses are Grade 2 listed. There's a Regency Pass too. But what qualifies Clevedon for world heritage status? It's historic interest, it's environmental interest, and it's um, unspoilt interest generally. We have a great deal of history to back up all of this. Clevedon has attracted poets and writers from Tolkien to Tennyson and councillors hope UNESCO's endorsement would encourage tourism and fund restoration. But is the town worthy of world status? I do, yeah, I think it's got the, I think the main attraction is the pier and the seafront and the pier alone and its heritage that, that goes along with that you know, is more than enough to qualify for it. You have to compare it to an existing world heritage site, say like Stonehenge or something like that. And it's very pretty, but it hasn't got enough. We love it because it's right on our doorstep and it obviously attracts a lot of visitors, the Victorian heritage and the water. Um, I think it would be lovely if it was granted world heritage status. Clevedon has the only Grade 1 listed pier in the whole of the UK. But councillors believe the town has so much more Victorian architecture and also its coastline that's worthy of world heritage status. 
Now the backers must convince the government and UNESCO the town is world class. Jane Solomons, ITV News, Clevedon. Well, I think it is anyway. Yes, I agree. Yes. Gets our vote. Yes. Now, you might recall a few months ago our coverage of a man from Gloucester, uh, Jamie MacDonald, who'd cycled halfway around the world for charity. We also covered his successful bid to break the world record for continuous pedalling 11 days in the saddle of a static bike. Ouch. Now, content, not content with all that, he came into the studio to tell us about his next adventure, running the equivalent of 200 marathons across Canada. This is what he said of the challenge he was facing. Once I got back, everyone was like, what are you doing next? And, <laughs> and so I just came up with this wacky idea of running across Canada. And you're running across Canada on your own? I mean, unaid, there's no support vehicles or support group going with you? No, that's what I like about this adventure. You know, if we had a support vehicle next to me, I feel like it would strip that. And, and being on my own, it's going to be more challenging. He is an utterly charming guy. He's now halfway through his challenge. Yes, and Katie Rowlett caught up with him on Skype to find out just how he's doing. I haven't even looked at the map yet for mainland Canada! Running through the vast expanse of the Canadian countryside, Jamie MacDonald has already completed the equivalent of 70 of his 200 marathons. He trained for the bitter winter in the deep freeze at Gloucestershire University at minus 20 degrees. Now he's having to endure weather at the other end of the scale. It's gone from one extreme to the, to the next. It's nearly 40 degrees now uh, with the humidity. Yeah, it's evil. It's absolutely evil. I've had to run through snowstorms, uh, <laughs> minus 25. And the snowstorms out here, I can tell you, are just not pretty. <laughs> um, I, I genuinely thought I was going to die at one point. Living life on the edge for charity is now second nature to the 26-year-old. On the Afghan border, he was shot during a cycling fundraiser when crossing 14,000 miles from Bangkok to his home city of Gloucester. It's taking four or five days off from work. The aim of this marathon expedition is to raise money for the Gloucestershire Royal Hospital, who helped him through a life-threatening childhood illness. I've completed 70 marathons and I've got 130 to go. Um, and I've got 150 days uh, to make that possible. So now the clock's ticking. Fingers crossed Jamie can keep going as long as possible to reach his fundraising target of £60,000. Katie Rowlett, ITV News. And we're all really rooting for him. We hope he does it. We will have updates on Jamie's progress on our website. There also, of course, every day, the rest of the day's news from the West Country. Our web address is there on the screen. Now, a 10-day festival of sport begins in Dorset this weekend. It's exactly a year after the start of the Olympics. Organisers hope to build on the success of a number of events held in Weymouth and on Portland during the Games. Twelve months on, businesses say it feels like a normal summer season after the disruption that they suffered during the Games and the preparations. Our Dorset correspondent Duncan Slightome reports. They're rolling out the rubber carpet for a special event on Weymouth Beach that hopes to fill a gap made by last year's sporting summer. For the next 10 days, there'll be a flavour of the Olympic-inspired events that on these sands last year drew tens of thousands of visitors. This time last year, they were getting ready to celebrate the opening of the Olympics here on Weymouth Beach. A year on, the impact of the Games on the town hasn't been forgotten, but there is a generally positive feeling about this summer season and the future. Mr Punch has entertained crowds for more than 300 years, but last year he had to compete against the world's biggest sporting event for attention. This year Weymouth is, is getting back to normal. Um, from my point of view, we've got our regular visitors back, the ones that come and support the show year after year um, with their families, and to me that is absolutely great. It's just what we need. At the Bourneville, on the seafront, they've noticed an increase in foreign visitors to the town. Whether it's because of the Olympics or not, they remain hopeful of buoyant business in the future. 
I don't know how many millions of people saw Weymouth on the TV, but it looked fantastic. The water looked beautifully blue, the beaches looked lovely, the location looked fantastic. And I think people at home saw that and said, let's go to Weymouth. It's a place we've not been to before, or we went to a long time ago and we want to see. So that's great for us. And I think the Olympic legacy of knowing that this was an Olympic city, an Olymp Olympic town, uh, is fantastic. So all of that will help us in the future. Last week, the Lord of the Olympic Rings, Sebastian Coe, looked at some of the legacy of the Games to Portland and to Weymouth. Visiting sailors helped boost business on the island in the run-up to the Olympics, but much of that trade has now moved on to Brazil. Time will tell whether it is replaced. Some businesses are going to do extremely well because of the positioning of Weymouth, Portland and Dorset through uh, Olympic publicity. Um, I'm very confident that in, in total people will be saying, right, uh, we've achieved in the year immediately after the Olympics more than we ever could have done if we didn't have the Olympics. Last year the world watched Weymouth and Portland. Now the Olympic rings maintain that watch over the borough. This area can only look back on the Olympics, but hope to look forward to a better future. Duncan Slightholm, ITV News, Portland. Now, rail enthusiasts normally look back on the age of steam with nostalgia, but this weekend there is a special celebration of the age of diesel on the Gloucestershire-Warwickshire Railway. Passengers will be able to see old locomotives in action and travel on them as well as Ken Goodwin has been finding out. There's a whiff of nostalgic romance about steam trains, a noisy, smoky, shiny mechanical beauty that poems have been written about. I kind of get that. But diesels? Uh... Well, they must be popular. The Gloucestershire-Warwickshire Railway, more usually associated with steam, is staging its first diesel gala weekend. Right, I need an expert. Dave Spencer is a walking, talking encyclopedia of all things diesel. There has to be a natural affinity with what you start to grow up with. And so I see the diesel locomotives of the 1960s and early 70s as a natural progression. The day didn't get off to a brilliant start. The diesel broke down and had to be towed back to Toddington Station by another diesel. So was this a kind of bonus for diesel enthusiasts because oh, yeah. you had an extra diesel towing a diesel? Certainly. Yeah. Why not? That was very exciting. And Dave's diesel facts just keep on coming. The horsepower is 1,160, and what isn't known generally is that they were uprighted unofficially by the depot at Inverness. On a steam train, there's the furnace, there's shoveling coal, a bit of muck. On a diesel, there's a 114 litre engine and a cabin with a handle to make it go. If you are a diesel enthusiast, what is the kind of creme de la creme of diesel? I mean, some people might say, oh, the Deltic, some might say the Westerns, you know, the big, old, big diesels. You see, whoosh, all of those names go straight over my yes. head. If you said Flying Scotsman to me, <laughs> I know what you mean. I think a lot, well, I think a lot of people might know what a Deltic is. We get a lot of people say, is this a Deltic, if they see something with a nose on the front. As we journey through the Gloucestershire countryside, I've seen people out there in the bushes with telephoto lens photographing this train. It's almost like there's a kind of diesel paparazzi. There's no doubt that this weekend's gala will be a huge success. Diesel fans are loving it. I don't know, I just like the noise, I think, really. You know, each, each one's got its own different, makes a different sound, so. We've always been with diesels and it's much more, from our era, much more enjoyable. For some, it seems diesel is now the new steam. Ken Goodwin, ITV News, Gloucestershire. I'm sure some of the train operators that I use still use those trains, <laughs> I have to say. I learnt a lot from that film, yeah, actually. Lovely. Um, now, Somerset County Cricket Club represent the region at the very top of the professional game, but an amateur team in the county is also moving up. Yeah, the county's visually impaired club only formed three years ago, but have rapidly grown in numbers and ability. Here's our sports correspondent, Matthias Kurt. On a rainy summer's day, they're forced inside to train. This group won't let anything dampen their enthusiasm for the game. It's a chance for visually impaired people to 
get together and play, basically. A chance for everyone to get out and do something com competitive. <laughs> Well, it's just, uh, you know, a lot of us are quite competitive, but it's a social aspect as well. I mean, after a hard day's training, we'll go to the, and have a couple of drinks. We, we play hard twice. So. Visually impaired cricket is played with bigger stumps and a bigger ball. And adapted rules allow players with varying degrees of visual impairment to play alongside each other. It's a sport for those individuals that perhaps didn't think they could play any sport and they can come along, see that there are opportunities and perhaps those that have come from a sport such as goalball, which is visually impaired specific, can see that actually they can then transfer those skills into a mainstream sport, so a sport that's played on village greens up and down the country by those that don't have a visual impairment. The trouble is it's difficult to explain because there are so many different uh, sight impairments. For example, I, although I categorise and see quite well, I can read very small print, newspaper print, uh, but in bright sunlight I, I would struggle, uh, so I, I drop a lot of catches. Primarily the rules are the same. Um, the totally blind players that we have, they can catch the ball on the bounce. Um, their batting runs count double. Somerset's visually impaired cricket club have made big strides this season and with only a couple of games still to play, they're set for promotion to the National League. It's building up and I should think once they get to the full county level when they'll be travelling nationwide then they'll be busy pretty much throughout the cricket season as any other cricket club would be. At the moment we're the only team in this region, although there is a team in Gloucestershire, um, so we've got people like that, there are three of us from Devon at the minute, um, so not all Somerset, um, but yeah, yeah we're trying to get a bigger impact, try and raise our profile, get a few more people involved. Matthias Kurt, ITV News, Somerset. It is time now for the story that Ian has been looking forward to all day. Uh -huh. A grumpy bulldog and a kitten are not a partnership which immediately springs to mind. Not at all. But that is exactly <laughs> what has happened in Cheltenham, where Harley the dog has stepped in as foster mum to Tigger, the abandoned little kitten. Nigel Turner has the story. At first sight, it looks like a puppy suckling from its mother. But look closer and you'll see it's a kitten. Tigger was brought into the Arvonia Veterinary Hospital in Cheltenham after being found abandoned. Claire Evans, who works there, brought him home. And her bulldog Harley quickly took charge. I know bulldogs make really intentive mothers. They are just simply brilliant at it. Um, she's never had puppies before. She's never had this instinct whatsoever. Um, so no, it just came naturally to her. I was quite amazed because she is quite grumpy when she wants to be. Um, but no, as you can see, this certainly brings out the softer side. When Harley and Tigger are together, they're both utterly content. You can hear Harley snoring. <coughs> and Tigger purring. When Tigger is weaned, he'll live next door with Claire's parents, which means she and Harley can stay the best of friends for the rest of their lives. Nigel Turner, ITV News. Gosh, if you didn't say R oh, during that, there's <laughs> something know. wrong with you, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, <laughs> heart of stone, if not. <laughs> Um, luckily the weekend is finally here and of course we want to know what the weather is up to. Yeah, Alex is on board a boat for us uh, right now at uh, the Bristol Harbour Festival. Uh, not any old boat though, Alex, that. No, I'm on board the HMS Gay Archer, which was nearly 